What are atoms? How do they look like? Let's take a look into what we have learned about them and how we think of them. The history of the atom, part four. So this is a planetary system. We have one big central mass in the middle and several smaller planets orbiting around it. Now, this is not to scale because if it were, the distances between planets would more be like a million times the size of the planets themselves. But then we couldn't see shit, so. This is not what atoms look like, but people thought so for a while. Firing a 15-inch shell at tissue paper. With the discovery of the electrons, we had actually already learned that atoms aren't indivisible, but consist of smaller parts. And of course, people were very interested in probing this inner structure of atoms. The only question was, how do that? And this is where a different discovery of around the same time comes in. Radioactivity. Henri Becquerel in 1896 and Marie Curie in 1898 identified elements that gave off this new radiation, designated alpha and beta rays. Gamma rays were found only later. Ernest Rutherford found out that the so-called alpha rays are just fully ionized helium atoms that were ejected with extremely high energies from unstable atoms. And his research of alpha and beta rays won him the 1908 Nobel Prize for Chemistry. And it turned out that these high energy alpha particles were exactly the tool that people had been missing to take a look inside the atom. Under Rutherford's direction, the physicist Hans Geiger and his student Ernest Marston performed a number of uh, scattering experiments between 1908 and 1913. And yes, that's the Geiger counter guy. This was the layout of their most famous experiment. They used radon-222 as a source for alpha particles and shot those at a thin foil of gold to measure the scattering angle. To do this, they had basically a microscope that detected flashes of light caused by the alpha particles, and they had to point this in a particular angle and then look through it and just count the flashes that they would get there. They had already seen some appreciable scattering of alpha rays by gold foil in the previous experiments, so they had constructed this setup so that they could measure almost a full 360 degrees range of angles. But what they saw exceeded all their expectations. They saw some alpha particles being deflected by more than 90 degrees and some even by almost 180 degrees, a full backscattering. According to the plum pudding model of the atom, this should not happen. Deflection should only be small, of a few degrees maybe, and only in forward direction. As Rutherford famously put it, it was almost as incredible as if you fired a 15-inch shell at a piece of tissue paper and it came right back and hit you. And just for reference, this is what a 15-inch gun looks like. The discovery of the nucleus. There were a few immediate deductions that Rutherford made from this. First, according to the conservation of momentum, a mass can only be scattered back by 180 degrees by a larger mass. Anything else would just scatter forward. Second, in terms of energy, this backscattering was like rolling upwards on the potential hill as long as the kinetic energy would carry it, and then it would turn around and roll back. As the electric potential was known, and all the properties of the alpha particles could be measured, this allowed an estimate for the maximum radius of the scattering object, which turned out to be around 10 to the 15 meters, a full 100,000 times smaller than the atom itself. This led to the 1911 Rutherford model of the atom. In the center of the atom is a nucleus that takes up almost no space. As we said, it's a full 100,000 times smaller, but it contains almost all the mass of the atom. The electrons orbit the nucleus like planets orbit the sun, but bound by the electrostatic force instead of gravity. The nucleus has positive charge, and its total charge is equal to the sum of the electron charges of the atom, so that it is neutral in total. He also deduced the Rutherford scattering formula with its characteristic uh, 1 over sine to the 4 angle dependence. Basically, it predicts what fraction of particles would be scattered into which direction. And when this was verified in 1913, of course again by Geiger and Marston, 
This was the breakthrough of the Rutherford atomic model. Many people also found it aesthetically pleasing that the microscopic world would mimic the universe at large, that within each atom you would find a miniature solar system. The legacy of Rutherford's model. Okay, so the Rutherford model was a definite step forward from the Thomson plum pudding model because everything it said about the inner structure of the atom was firmly based on experimental data. From another perspective, however, it didn't address any of the most striking problems all previous atomic models had already had. How can you have rotating electric charges without radiating away all the energy? How can the weird emissions and absorption spectra of the elements be explained? How is the chemical behavior of the elements linked to their structure and, and why the strange periodicity in the periodic table? So in that regard, it was more like a detail improvement of the Thomson model while skirting all the deeper issues. And this meant that it really couldn't be expected to persist for long and sure enough, just a couple years later it was replaced by the Bohr model of the atom. It was, however, the last atomic model that could be easily visualized, so it, it lives on basically until today as a go-to picture of atoms. If you see any drawing of an atom anywhere, it's basically the Rutherford model. I guess that's just the problem with trying to visualize something that you, you cannot, you categorically cannot visually observe.